Welcome back to another Interactive Brokers series video. I don't know if that's the best way to say it, but we're gonna say it like that. So I was finally able to get a response from Interactive Brokers. So we've been kind of working back and forth the last two days or something like that. Basically, there's some type of issue with their server. Um, they haven't really, I would say, I don't know if they devised the solution. They gave me a workaround. I don't know what that means from the client portal perspective as to what has to change on their end. But currently there is a solution. There's a way around it. It seems to be working pretty reliably. Um, so that's encouraging. Um, but I would say definitely keep an eye out for changes related to the API. I wouldn't be surprised if um, you, know, you just notice things that might change one day just because i'm assuming that they probably have adjusted something or something along that nature um actually some interesting stuff to just kind of uh what am i trying to say thinking about you know just what i've explored the last couple of days so obviously i wasn't i wasn't able to do the videos so i spent a lot of time actually exploring a little bit more of the api and i basically ran into something very similar that i ran into td ameritrade which is even though the documentation is saying one thing, when you actually look behind the scenes and you, you see how the API works, um, there's certain things that are available that I don't think they make publicly available in the sense of like they don't put in the documentation, but I haven't had an issue yet with re the request. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of what I've been able to determine so far, there's a tremendous amount of fundamental data now available. Um, I was kind of blown away of just literally how detailed I can get, but we're talking like balance sheets, we're talking income statements, we're talking um, cash flow statements quarterly, um, annually, all sorts of different stuff. There have been news headlines. So apparently you can get news headlines with the API. So this is doing it with Apple. Um, there are, where is it? There's like fundamentals just in general. Um, I would say the fundamental stuff, it, it, you know, that's pretty straightforward actually once you look at it. Uh, this one, again, just looking at it right now, is that not the one? Hold on one sec. I have it here, so I'm just gonna, there it is. Perfect, so then there's fundamental summaries. So just a ton of information. And then on top of that, they have all these scores, right? So they use like, they make things available something like, I don't know, you know, what is it like analyst ratings? So I don't know if this will technically work on, uh, what is it? Oh no, it does work, it works fine. So. They give you like analyst ratings over time and just everything. And then who gave it, the firm they came from, their ranking. There's just a tremendous amount of data here that they're not putting in the documentation. They have ratio details. They have dividends. They have just a whole bunch of stuff. And it's like, I barely feel like I've scratched the surface with it because each one of those little widgets that I'll go to has five different endpoints it's pulling from, it feels like. So... I have a lot more exploring to do on this particular topic. So, um, you know, basically what I'm just trying to let you know is don't be surprised if all of a sudden you're going in there like, wait, there's like five different endpoints he added and there's nowhere in the documentation that it says that. It's more than likely it came from like one of my exploration sessions. Um, but yeah, I was I was, I was kind of surprised because I, I was having a lot of hope <laughs> with uh, interactive broker because I thought their documentation was a little bit more up to date and it it doesn't appear to be the case. It seems like there's actually a lot more available than technically what's provided in the documentation. So that's good news for us though because obviously that means we have more to work with but um, it just means it takes a little bit more time building certain things because now I have to explore and say okay well what if I don't put in this argument or if I do put in this argument you know what happens you know xyz. So that's basically where I'm at right now. Um, what are we going to do in today's video? Well, we're going to start building our client, right? So this is going to be the client, the interactive broker API client for Python. And really, when we're thinking about building this client, what are some things that we have to take into consideration? Well, probably the biggest thing that you're going to notice right away is we have to have some type of mechanism to interact with this Java server that's supposed to handle all the authentication process and the server aspect. 
Additionally, I wanted to make this process a little bit easier for everybody where they could leave the server open, they could rerun their Python script, and it's gonna simply latch on to an existing uh, server if it exists. Now, this isn't the most resilient procedure. I'm looking for ways to kind of improve it, but basically what I do is I take the process ID that is associated with this particular server and I save it in a JSON file. And so the idea behind that is then when you run the script again, as long as you have that process ID uh, still active, I should at least be able to check if that process is still running. And if it is, I just basically assume it's still running that we're still authenticated. So I'm not necessarily latching back on but I'm at least able to tell that the server is running um, just because if you actually want to latch onto a process in Python, it's supposedly it's pretty challenging from what I've seen, especially after the script has stopped running. So that's just kind of things we have to think about. Um, <clears throat> obviously things before, you know, how do we handle account numbers, passwords and stuff like that? Do we need to save that information? Really in this case, we don't. There's really nothing here that we have to save. Um, compared to the TD Ameritrade API, just because in the TD Ameritrade, we have admin access token, a refresh token. Um, so there was a lot more behind the scenes that I had to save because as you were making requests, if that access token obviously was you know, expired, I have to go out and get a new access token for you using your refresh token. So there were just things like that when it came to um, uh, what is it, you know, using the TD Ameritrade API vice using the interactive broker one. So those are just kind of the high level things that we have to take into consideration when we're building this. Other than that, though, you're going to see for the most part, it's relatively the same. I think probably the most challenging part is how do we handle the authentication process? Um, I don't know. I think I've kind of narrowed it down per se as to what it's going to look like, but for right now, it's not necessarily, I would say, the cleanest part of it. Um, so, you know, just keep that, you know, in mind. All right, so let's get started. So we're going to use a bunch of libraries. <laughs> the first one is going to be OS, so we're going to import OS. And I'm actually going to zoom this in a little bit so that way everyone can see it. Perfect. Um, that's for our operating system. Um, so there's going to be some information that we need to know about an individual's operating system because basically what I'm doing from the client perspective is I'm actually going to boot up the server for you. I have to know what operating system you're on because I'm going to be using um, the command line to do that. Additionally, we're going to be using the system module. So this is, uh, again, information related to your system information. We're going to be using a lot of JSON. So we need the JSON library. Um, we're going to be importing time. Uh, I don't think I'm actually using this anywhere in the script, but I'm just going to import it just to be safe because there was at some point, I think I was pausing for some reason, and I think it was more um, waiting for that server to boot up. So I, I don't want to necessarily redirect you. I don't want to necessarily like start showing something when the server is not actually running. So this was kind of my way of saying, okay, pause it for like two or three seconds and then actually boot up the server, um, just things like that. Additionally, we are going to be working with a lot of uh, system paths and file paths. So we're going to want to make sure that we're using pathlib. Um, this will make uh, constructing those paths on different operating systems more consistent. We are going to be working with URL. So we're going to need a URL lib. We're going to be doing a lot of requests. So we need requests. And then something that's probably new um, that most of us probably haven't seen is sub process. So the idea behind sub process is that I can basically spin up other processes from my, my current Python script. In this sense, what am I really doing? Well, what I'm really doing is I'm creating a new sub process that's going to boot up my server. That's really the idea behind it is I'm going to use this sub process to then boot up that server. And then once we boot up that server, um, I kind of keep it running in the background. So that's kind of its own process. It's separate from this main Python script. That's kind of how I like to think about it. So we're going to need sub process in order to do that. These for right now, we're just going to not going to talk about this too much. Um, so one thing that we, well, one thing that I have to do is I have to look through how do we the server requires a certificate, but the thing is you can actually override that using the request module where it doesn't matter. 
Um, what we can do is we can self sign our certificate. And so one thing that I'm doing right now is I'm basically, uh, what is it? I'm basically suppressing this error that's gonna naturally pop up because that certificate isn't valid. So this is just to basically suppress those warnings. Now, obviously, if we were in a development aspect about this, we would not want to do this, but just because this is kind of for our own personal use right now, um, we can keep it uh, where it's in this weird state where it's not necessarily um, you know, doing anything crazy. But yeah, technically when I publish this library, we should have some type of mechanism in here where we can either create a self-signed certificate or something like that. Okay, so um, basically we're gonna use URL lib, there's an exceptions component and we're gonna import the insecure request warning. So that's basically just going to, um, uh, what is it, suppress those particular warnings. And so really all we're doing is we're gonna say URL lib three dot URL, sorry, dot disable warnings and then it's gonna be category, and then it's gonna be the insecure request warning. So basically what we're saying is every time you have something where you're saying the request is insecure because you don't have like your little certificate um, or we're not verifying it, I don't care about those warnings, just keep going. That's basically all this little section is doing, but over time this section will be removed and some process will have to be put in place to where we either give instructions on how to self-sign your own certificate or we do something on our end where um, we can put that in there. That's basically all we wanna make sure we're doing. So that's why that section's there. Okay, so now that we've done that, we can make our main client. So this is gonna be called our IB client. This regular IB client, it's a class object. So it's gonna have methods and properties and some Dunder methods that do different things about it, right? So our main particular method that at least we start out with is the double underscore init method. What this method does is every time we create a new instance of our wonderful client object, we're gonna be asking for certain information. Some of that information is things like account numbers, username, passwords. This is information where if you want to use the API to do things like query your account transactions, well, obviously I need your account information, right? So this is basically saying, hey, if you wanna use this client, I need some information in order to make it where you can use the client because the API is going to request certain information. Things like, which account do you want me to lock into? So just because we have five different accounts doesn't mean we have to lock into every single one of them. We can lock into just one of them and have that be our main access point through the API. So those are things that I have taken into consideration when I'm building it. And so part of it is saying, okay, from a user perspective, what information do I need from them in order to kind of go through that process? There is a password component, but technically speaking, this doesn't actually need to be here. So um, really, I would say at a bare minimum, we only really need the account number, but for right now, we're just gonna keep in the username and password just because there might be some times where we might wanna store that information for them or we might wanna pick, pick up um, what I'm really trying to do, and the only reason I'm keeping this in here right now is I am trying to automate the login process for paper trading at least. For regular trading, I can't do it unfortunately because it's a two-factor authentication and basically what's going to happen is when you log in, they're gonna send you a security code either through the mobile app or they're going to text it to you. There is no way around this. Now you technically could, if you wanted to, have some type of mechanism where I would guess you could listen and you could say, okay, that request was made. Um, you could have something that listens to a, uh, some type of Python library that listens to your number or something like that. I've heard of that. I've seen that to a certain extent. I haven't personally built that, um, but there are methods out there to do that and you could have it interact with that. I think that's beyond the scope of this library. I think for the most part, as long as we can keep the server running, I really do want people to kind of log in. I don't want them necessarily having a completely automated process just because I think, you know, naturally, if you're gonna be trading, you wanna make sure that that information is, you, you, you wanna basically make sure that the person's logging in. You know, I wouldn't really feel comfortable saying, oh yeah, it's just completely automated and trust 100%. Um, you do want some type of component about it. Um, I think what we can more focus on is, okay, we've created that session. They know that session is running. They've gotten some type of notification that that session is running. Now we can just maintain it. That's really all we care about. Okay, so now that we've done that, what are the things that we're gonna need? Well, 
let's take our account number for the time being. So we're gonna need account. And then also we're going to use our username name. That's gonna be our username. And then we're gonna need our password. Well, this is our password, obviously. And then we're gonna have some very specific stuff. So I am going to need the need to know the location of that client portal. Now I did speak to TD Ameritrade and they said that I need to download the client portal dot beta dot gateway. So um, this might change slightly, uh, just a tiny, tiny bit, but basically that's their latest one. I was directed that the beta one is the most recently one updated. I was kind of surprised to hear that. I thought that would have, they just, well, why don't you make it the main client portal one? But for whatever reason, I guess the, the beta one is the one that we actually want. So this is going to change slightly, but literally it's just naming the path. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to call this client underscore portal underscore folder. And so we're going to call our path lib module. There is a path object that's in there. That path object has a current working directory method. This returns a path that basically is the current working directory. And then from there, there is a join path method. So what we can do is we can basically join a part of another path to our current path that is the current working directory. So I want to join the client portal.gw. That's basically this guy right here. So I'm just gonna join that to my main path. And then there's this really cool method called resolve. This resolve method will basically resolve it so that way the path comes out so it's operating specific, sorry, operating system uh, compatible. So if it's on Windows, it's gonna make sure it's compatible with Windows. If it comes, if it's on Mac or Linux, it's gonna make sure it's compatible with Mac or Linux. That's why I really like this module and I've been using it a lot more is simply because of the fact that it will handle uh, manipulating and transforming paths as needed. So that's really um, some of our key, I would say constants. There's a couple more here that we need to take into consideration. So one, for example, is going to be the API version. Now, for the most part, I haven't really seen this change at all. So it's still at V1, but I think it's important we keep it in here. Additionally, we are going to have some um, private attributes about our particular um, IB client. One of those private attributes is going to be the operating system. So we're going to call the system module, and then there's a platform attribute, which basically says, hey, is this, what platform is this user on? Are they on Mac? Are they on Linux? Are they on Windows? Tell me the operating system that they're on. So that way I know how to treat certain things inside the client. So for example, how do I boot up the server? If I know what operating system they're on, I can assume certain things. Okay, if they're on Mac, call the terminal. Okay, if they're on Windows, call the console. That's basically what we're doing. Okay, and then from here, we're gonna have another attribute. This one will be a public one, and we'll call this server process. So with this one, it's going to be a, a method that we define in our client. So we're gonna use the self keyword, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do underscore server underscore state. This method is going to have an argument called action. And that action, when we initialize our client, will be to load the server state. Now you can kind of guess what's going on here. Basically, I'm trying to pick up where we left off. So if that server is already running, I want to be able to pick up that server state. Okay. And then finally, we're going to have an attribute called authenticated. Now we will initialize that to false. The only time I wanna change this is when I know that the user is authenticated. And we can verify that by actually calling the URL. That's the important part behind this is making sure that we can actually call this information <clears throat> um, from the API. So that's those are kind of, I would say, the kind of specific things that are related to the operation of the actual client. These are more constants. These are basically information that is used to kind of maintain the overall functionality of the client. Now these are all attributes that belong to this class object. So that's why I'm using that self keyword. 
And again, I'm sure if some of you have seen my TD Ameritrade, um, what is it, uh, series. This is a special uh, method, so it's called a Dunder method. It's, Dunder is short for double underscore. Basically, there are special methods that belong to class objects. The special methods do different things, right? So there's one for um, how what happens when you print that client object. What is it gonna show on the terminal? Um, there's some for what happens if you use a, a length function on that object. Uh, on the um, that class object, what's going to happen, right? So these are just special methods. This particular method that I'm defining right here is called double underscore init. It's short for initialization. And basically, this method is special because it's called every time you create a new instance of this client, so of this client object. And what we can do is we can use this method to say, hey, what are the things that we want to have happen every time we create a new instance of this object. Well, basically all I'm really doing at this point is I'm defining some constants and I'm gonna be calling at this point a single method. But other than that, it's relatively limited. We've seen in other ones, so the TD Ameritrade series, there's actually a lot more going on right there. But for this one, it's pretty straightforward. There's not too much that we kind of have to do. Okay, so now that we've done those components, so we'll call these our constants. And then we'll call these operation attributes, something like that, just to kind of categorize them a little bit. Um, next, we're gonna have what we call our URL components. So define URL components. And it's not really URL components because technically like we haven't built the URL, but these are basically going to be the constants that we'll be using when we use the server. Now, technically, I'm gonna make this a little bit more dynamic down the road because you do have the ability to specify your own host and your own port. But for the most part, I'm gonna assume most of you right now want to do just the local host connection. So it's gonna be HTTPS colon two forward slash, and then it's gonna be local host. And then from here, we're gonna have another one called IB gateway underscore port. So this will be the port that it's on. This by default will just be 5,000. Again, I do plan to change these at some point, but for right now, let's just kind of leave them as is. Now, when we have these two components, technically we don't have enough to redirect the user. What we need is we need to combine these two. So we're gonna actually create a attribute that is um, accessible anywhere from the client. And that attribute is gonna be called IB gateway, and then this one will be path. And so that's simply taking the host, it's adding a colon, and then it's gonna add that IB gateway port. Now, technically, I probably could have just did this on one line, but, you know, maybe break it out. I think the reason I'm doing this right now is because again, I'm still maybe thinking, I'm gonna be passing it through and I'm still debating about what might be the best way for that. Okay. So now that we've defined how what's going to happen when we initialize our client, what should we do next? Well, there's one thing that we need to have defined, obviously. One is loading the server state. So this server state method, this is basically the, the method that's going to try to pick up where we left off. So say the script stops running for some reason. Um, what I want to be able to do is pick up and see if the server is still running. Now, if the server's down, the server's down. I can't do anything about that. Um, we would just have to boot up a new server. But if the server is still running, it should still have a process ID attached to it. If I can find that process ID, then I know that at least the server's up and running, then I can try to authenticate and see what happens. That's basically the idea behind this method. So we're gonna call this method, del sorry, uh, underscore server state. And again, we want this to be accessible by our class, so we'll use the self keyword. And then with this one, it's going to have an argument, a single argument called action. By default, action will be saved. Now, you might be asking, Alex, why'd you put a leading underscore right there? So this is just convention whenever you use uh, Python. One of the conventions is if it's a private method, so private meaning that the user shouldn't have to access it, it's something that's reserved, they don't need to touch it, 
you always take your method name and you lead it by an underscore. So a leading underscore basically means it's a private method that the user does not need to have access to. Same with attributes. If it's a private attribute, the user doesn't really need access to it. So you denote it by a leading underscore. That's the idea. <clears throat> okay, so from here, now what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, basically pick up and try to get the actual um, server state, right? So part of it is we want to, uh, what is it? We wanna be able to, to find the JSON file. Well, the JSON file is gonna be in our IBW folder. And with that uh, JSON file, we're going to want to actually um, load it. So we basically just want to load that particular um, JSON file. Now, I did want to share a method uh, for also creating a path. If you choose not to do path lib or something like that, there are alternatives out there. You don't have to use that one. Um, I've just been using it more because um, I think it just works a little bit better, but that's just my opinion. Um, what we can do is we can do the os.path. There is a directory name, and then we can do os.path real path and then it's underscore file. So basically with this one, it's going to return the directory name that this file is in. So it's going to basically negate the file, but it's gonna say, hey, where does this particular file live? Well, it currently lives in this folder. So once we have that component, we have the directory name. Now we need the file name, right? So now with the file name, it's going to be, sorry, let me, a little underscore right there. It's going to be server underscore session dot JSON. Okay, so now that we have our file name, let's do our file path. With our file path, it's just going to take OS path and we're going to do join. So the join method basically just joins multiple paths. And we're going to do our directory path and our file name. And so with our file name, we now have a full path. Something I do like to make sure is that the file exists. So what I do is I use the OS path. There's an exist method. If we pass through that file path, it's going to return a Boolean. If that file exists, you guessed it, it will return true. If that file does not exist, well, guess what? It doesn't exist and then you have an issue, right? So um, those are just kind of things to keep in mind. Basically, this is just checking to make sure the file exists. Um, and we can handle it. So what are we gonna have happen in this method um, depending on the action? Well, there are gonna be a couple different actions. There's technically three. One is going to be save, one is going to be load, and one is going to be delete. So save means save the current state. <laughs> load means load the previous state, and delete means delete the current state. So if you choose to close this server, it will delete that JSON file. I want to delete that JSON file because the minute you close that server, I cannot latch onto it. That process ID is dead. There's no sense of me trying to latch onto it because it doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. Um, so it's important that I maintain that delete method because if I don't, um, basically what's going to happen is it's going to try to latch onto a server that doesn't exist. Now, depending on the action, we'll take the first one, which is save. What do we want to do if we want to save our particular um, state. Well, we're going to use the with open, and then we're going to open our JSON file, and we're going to open it in write mode. Now, the thing is, if there is already a file there, I don't care. It's just going to overwrite that file. I'm okay with that because if I am saving a state, more than likely it's a new state. And so I want to overwrite the previous one. So note the W. If I wanted to write to an existing file, I would do append. Append meaning that I want to take the existing one, um, not delete it, and then just overwrite it. Now, in this case, I'm okay with just overwriting it. Okay, and then we're going to do json.dump. We're going to pass through a dictionary called server process underscore ID. And then we're going to do self.server process. So this one right here, right there. And then from here, um, we're going to do server um, file. Now this one's kind of a little bit misleading because you're like, aren't you just loading the file? Kind of. Um, 
it's a little bit more than that. So technically, um, what's actually going to happen is it's actually, I'll put it like this. If it already exists, um, we want to be calling the save method. So here specifically, because I'm calling load, it's not technically taking the previous one. Um, I'm calling the save one at a different point in the script. And so basically at that point, what I've done is I've overwritten this one at this current state. That's basically what happens. Hopefully that made sense. If not, I'm sorry. Additionally, we're gonna have a second action, which is going to be called load. Now you guessed it, this one's going to load the current state, but I wanna have another condition in here, which is I wanna make sure that file exists because I cannot load a file that does not exist. So if it does exist, then load the file. Now, really what I could do is I can just take this little guy right here and I can just basically copy it and then change a few things about it. So in this case, I'm not gonna write to it, I'm actually going to read to it. And then from here, um, I'm actually just gonna do JSON load. In this case, I don't care about that dictionary anymore, I really just care about that actual server file. Additionally, I will uh, save that in a variable called server state. That will basically be my new one. And here comes the fun part. <laughs> here comes fun part. So we've loaded it. That's fun, right? So we've loaded our wonderful file. What next? Well, now we're going to try and see, does this particular process still exist? If it does exist, let's return the process ID. Here's how we can test for it. Now, there is a method for the operating system module called kill. What you can do is you can pass through the server, uh, what is it, the server state, and then it's going to be server underscore process ID, and then it's basically the signal zero. So again, just to kind of reiterate, I've loaded my JSON file. Well, it's just gonna be this little dictionary right here. So all I care about is the server process ID. And what I'm going to do is basically, <clears throat> I'm trying to think the best way to explain this because <laughs> it's a little bit confusing if you're not sure what's going on. But basically, it's gonna try to see if the server is still running. And so if it is running, then basically it's going to return an error. So what we need to keep an eye out for is the type of error that it returns. So this is one where I'm gonna just refer back to my original one because I don't want to um, confuse myself too much, right? Because I do that sometimes. So there's actually a bug too. So this is actually a, apparently, a, I didn't realize this, this is apparently a well-known bug in Python. So there's certain things that, what is the best way to talk about this? There's basically some stuff where the operating system, it doesn't handle certain actions correctly. One of those actions is basically like the terminate method or basically like the control C break event. And so what can happen is it actually returns the wrong signal or it basically just freaks out and it doesn't know what you're doing. So I don't know the exact details of to why this bug still exists, but apparently it's a well-known one in Windows. And so if we call this method, it actually can sometimes return back a system error. It doesn't necessarily mean it's dead. It just means that it probably ran into that particular bug. What we're really looking for, at least from what I can tell, is if, it actually encounters an OS error. So if it returns an OS error, that means that basically that process ID doesn't exist. And so um, basically what happens is it will actually, it means it's basically still up and running. That's kind of how you kind of need to think about it is it actually still means it's up and running. Um, but uh, that's really kind of what we're trying to do here is we're just basically trying to see if it's still up and running. If it is still up and running, um, then basically it's going to return the process ID if there was like a system error or um, if there was an operating system error, then in that case, it kind of ran into that particular bug. If it did, it means it's still actually running. So I'm sorry if that confused you, but that's basically how I'm doing it right now. I'm sure this will probably change a little bit. I 
I kind of don't like the logic of it right now. And I'm really not happy that I'm kind of having to do this workaround with a bug. So I hope by maybe in a few videos, I'll kind of have this maybe built a little bit more in a resilient manner or more what I would call logical manner. Um, just because I really don't trust this right now. I feel like it's going to, it's worked so far, but I don't know, something's off about it and I'm not necessarily positive it's gonna work all the time. So don't be surprised if that portion changes. Okay, additionally, we're gonna deal with our last action, which is basically delete. And so with delete and file exists. So if you do the delete action and the file exist, then do OS remove and then uh, just remove that file path. That's really everything that's gonna go there. And then finally, um, we wanna just return nothing in that case. So if you pass through something that just doesn't make sense, um, we'll return none. Really, this should never really happen because the only time this is called is internally. So that means I'm inherently calling something that I know I never built into it. But uh, for right now, I've kind of left it in there. So here, what are we doing? Handle the case to save the session. Handle the case to load a, an existing session. And then finally handle the case to close an existing, an existing session. And then the, our fail case. Here, what are we doing? Build the file path. Okay. How much time have we gone over so far? Ooh, cutting that. All right, so at this point, um, I think I've taken long enough for this video just to kind of recap and go over. Um, first, we kind of covered, talked about the bug that, well, it's not a bug, but basically there's a server issue with Interactive Broker. So that seems to be at least in the process of being fixed, but we do have a workaround currently. So um, I'm okay with starting up the series. And then from there, um, we kind of talked about more of the context, like how do we think about building this client? What are some considerations we have to take it in? What are some considerations we have to think about um, when it comes to the server, um, when it comes to maintaining a session? So that way, when somebody uses this library, it's not a crazy pain. Um, so things like that. Then we talked about the actual importing of libraries, which ones we were going to be using and why we were going to be using them. And then we started building our actual class object. And then we talked about the double underscore init method, which is basically our method that we call every time we create a new instance of this object. And really all we were doing is just defining some constants and we were also going to be loading the previous state. So um, if it exists, obviously. And then we built kind of that big function, which is handling the actual creating of the that server in a sense, or saving the state of the server, loading the previous state of the server, or in a certain case, if that server is closed, then deleting that trace file. So that way we don't run into the situation where we're trying to connect to a session that was previously closed. So that's basically what we covered in this video. If you have any questions related to those topics, by all means, put them down in the comments below and I will do my best to get back to you. Otherwise, we will see you in the next video.